Hi, everyone. As you are filtering in here, um, I will introduce myself, go over a few housekeeping things, and we will get started. So my name is Ellie Moffitt. I work with Sales Tax and More. We are very grateful to have you here. We hope everyone is doing well. Um, like I said before we get started, just going to go over a few housekeeping things. So first and foremost, if you are here for CPE credit, fantastic. We do need you to do a few things in order to receive that CPE credit. The first thing we'll need you to do is answer our poll questions, and we will also need you to fill out the survey at the end of this webinar. There are two ways you can do that. You can fill it out as you are leaving the webinar. It should automatically pop up on your screen. You can also fill it out in an email you will receive in 24 hours. Both ways work, no need to do it twice, uh, but you do have to fill that out in order to receive your CPE credit. A few more important things to take note of. If you have questions as we go through, please ask those questions. Uh, we want to answer all of them, whether that's at the end of the webinar or following up with you via email. Uh, ask your questions as you have them. Please use the Q&A button in the middle of the screen. We will also be sending out the slides and our handouts in today's chat box. I'll be sending you a link where you can access everything that we have in today's webinar. Uh, let's do a quick introduction here for Sales Tax and More. Sales Tax and More is a full service consulting and solutions firm. We have a really great team here of experienced tax professionals who are very dedicated to fulfilling your state tax and related needs. So we do a lot of returns, registrations, consultations, research, and like our name states more. So if you have questions, please reach out and ask. We'd love to answer those questions. Um, and a quick introduction for our founder here, Mike Fleming. Uh, Mike's state tax knowledge is very well-rounded. He's one of the United States leading authorities when it comes to e-commerce, Nexus, service providers, and drop shipping. Over the years, he's literally assisted thousands of sellers uh, with their tax issues. Um, so Mike, if you want to take it from here, we can go ahead and get started. And you guys will hear from me when we get to those poll questions. Well, thank you very much for that uh, warm and smooth welcome, Ellie. And uh, uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking this time to uh, uh, spend with us on, on this webinar. Uh, before we get started, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, COVID-19. Uh, we get a lot of questions about this, but before we get into some of the resources we've got out there, I just ask that um, share some positivity with your, your fellow coworkers, with your um, you know, clients, uh, with uh, your neighbors, with your family members. Uh, that's something that we're asking everyone to do here um, because not only is this crisis uh, having a financial impact and a physical impact, uh, uh, you know, on our health, uh, but also uh, mentally, it's taking uh, quite a toll on, on a number of us mentally. Um, I shared uh, a couple of webinars ago uh, last week or so that we had a family member who actually tried to take their life because it just became uh, so overwhelming for them. And now we have these stories about this doctor in New York who's, you know, been helping save so many lives that it's, have taken their lives. So some of us can handle this much better than others. Um, but, you know, reach out. Make sure that, you know, everyone truly is doing okay. Um, and that's what we ask of you. Just carry a positive message forward. When it comes to sales tax and COVID-19, we uh, put together some resources. We've got a special page uh, out there. Uh, we also cover the uh, uh, income taxes, the state income taxes, and um, the extensions. Uh, there's a, a blog post out there that I've done that say not all extensions are created equal. And we're really talking about the differences between an income tax um, uh, extension and a sales tax extension. Uh, what a lot of people don't realize, and by the way, that's not my dog, however, uh, I have had dogs, you know, tear up toilet paper, one of our most precious commodities um, in, in this crisis. Um, but there's a big difference between uh, using income tax money to fund your business or, uh, you know, counseling your, your clients to do so and using sales tax money. 
because, you know, income tax money is, is your money. You know, it's supposed to go to the government. And, you know, if it's late, the government will slap your hand, give you a little fine and penalty. But sales tax is never or almost never your money and uh, or your client's money. It's generally the state's money or it's generally uh, your customer's money. Um, you know, we just collect that money um, in trust. So we're, it's not our money. So um, if we, we're taking that money, sometimes states view that as stealing. So even though they're allowing, you know, uh, us to push back the, the due dates, um, that's really so that, you know, with all of this disruption of having people from work and having our accountants, uh, you know, uh, not be able to access our data perhaps as efficiently as um, if uh, they were in their office, they're giving us some time to account for that. Um, but they, they don't, as some states are coming right out and saying, you know, this is not your money. Don't use it to fund your business. Um, other people like Governor Newsom out in California, I think he's, he's very, you know, his heart's in the right place. But, you know, if I use credit cards to, to fund my business, and unfortunately, if my business goes under, um, I can file bankruptcy and get a fresh start. You know, I can walk away from that credit card debt. You can't do that with sales tax money. Remember, it's not our money. So when it comes time to, to pay that to the state, um, and we can't do it, there can be criminal penalties up to and including uh, jail time for tax collected, not remitted. That's, that's the cardinal sin of sales tax. Uh, there's also personal responsibility, and it generally survives both personal and business bankruptcies. So we take this interest-free loan that Governor Newsom is talking about, and we fund our business with this, and then our business goes under. That's bad enough, but things can get worse because as of now, they're not waiving any of this personal responsibility. They're not waiving any of these criminal penalties or or, or even, you know, uh, worse. Um, so, you know, your business goes under and, and you can't walk away from it like a loan or, or a credit card. It, it's going to follow you. And that point is not being made well enough, I, I, I don't think. So uh, we have people who, you know, are, are calling us and asking us if they can put this off. And our answer is, you know, if there's any way possible go ahead and pay it. We even have some clients, you know, we do sales tax returns for, uh, for our clients. And some of our clients are saying, Hey, I know this money's not due to the quarter, but take it. I collected it. I want it out of sight, out of mind. If it's here, I'll be tempted to use it. I want you guys to hold on to it. So I think that's smart because, you know, just about any other type of money, is a better source of funds than trust funds. And that goes for your payroll taxes, the withholding taxes, as well as these uh, uh, sales taxes. So just want to get that out there. Uh, Mass, excuse me, Maine sent out a letter the other day that I think sums this up very well. I've highlighted two sections here. Um, it says, unlike income tax, sales tax, and state tax withholding tax, um, our trust fund taxes held in trust. Um, you go down to the next section, it says Maine law prohibits taxpayers from using these trust fund taxes for their own pur purposes. Um, so basically what Maine's saying is against the law to fund your business with these taxes. And a lot of states have put out uh, statements like this, but not all of them, but they all have statutes on the books that talk about this. So if you're you know, advising your clients or if you're advising, you know, the powers that be at your company or if you're the de final decision maker, just keep all of this in mind. And if you do have to use this money to fund your business, um, I, I just hope that everybody has the ability uh, to actually pay those taxes when they actually come due. If anyone needs any more information about this, please reach out. All right, so let's uh, get into uh, what we're going to cover today. These are the seven pillars. And over all my time in, uh, you know, sales tax, um, I found that we can trace all problems in audits to one of these seven uh, uh, issues, uh, one of these seven pillars. So, you know, 
we're not going to be able to avoid audits, but if we understand these pillars and, you know, uh, address them, uh, then we can greatly reduce uh, any assessments uh, that may come out of an audit. So we can't, you know, avoid audits. Uh, we can, you know, try to limit um, our exposure to audits, uh, but we can definitely um, uh, reduce our liabilities. So today we're going to cover nexus, we're going to cover taxability, we're going to cover rates, and we're going to cover use tax. Um, we're going to cover the next three um, pillars uh, on Friday. Uh, we're going to open it up to, to questions on the end here. So uh, as you can see, I've got three screens here. I'm looking from one screen to the other, and I talk with my hands, so I find that very distracting. Um, I'm going to turn off my camera um, as we go into our first poll question, then I'll turn the camera back on um, at the end of the presentation uh, when we open it back up for questions. So uh, always remember the worst time to find out you have problems or the worst time your clients can find out that they have problems is when the state is sending an email or knocking on the door or making a telephone call. Uh, if you're being proactive, You've got lots of options to mitigate any past exposure. Um, if you're reacting to a state, virtually most of those options go away. So a lot of options if you're being proactive, very few options if you're being reactive. And Ellie, let's, uh, let's go to our first poll question. Absolutely, that should be up on everyone's screen right now. We want to know how you would rate your Nexus knowledge. So. Uh, Mike, so far we have a pretty good mix of people who are here. Quick reminder that you do have to answer these questions in order to receive CPE credit. We'll, we will leave them up for 15, 20 seconds each question. So uh, Mike, a lot of people who don't know anything, most people fall somewhere in the middle and we even have a couple of experts in the crowd today. So we're gonna close this out and move on. All right. Um, good mixture. Uh, we have a couple people in there to keep me honest, those experts. Um, for those of you who are beginners, let's start out with a, a real basic definition. Um, a nexus is just a fancy word that means link or connection, and it's the link or connection that must be present before state can require you to do anything, like collect its taxes, like a, a sales tax or a seller's use tax, or, or pay its taxes, like an income tax, a, a franchise tax, or a consumer's use tax. So we say that it all starts with nexus, because if you don't have this link or connection, if you don't have this nexus, then no problems, no responsibility. You don't have to take any further steps. Now, if you do have nexus, it's not the end of the world. Maybe, um, you know, what you're selling is not taxable. Maybe um, you have nexus, but someone else is responsible for collecting the tax, like a marketplace. Um, so, you know, it all starts with nexus, but it, it doesn't always end with nexus. There are, are steps that we need to look at. And these are some of the other pillars that we're going to go through. Now, uh, economic nexus is, is relatively new for sales tax. It's been around for quite a while for income tax. But for sales tax, it's a result of the Wafer versus South Dakota, which was uh, decided by the U.S. Supreme Court in uh, 19, excuse me, 2018, June 21st to be exact. And um, what this case did is overturn the two previous cases. It was National Bellis, Hess, and Quill, um, where the U.S. Supreme Court talked about re the requirement for some sort of physical presence. Now, we can all argue what that physical presence was, but at least there had to be some type of physical presence. Not anymore. The Supreme Court came out and they said, you know, we were wrong. They didn't say, hey, you know, things are different today. They said we were wrong back then. We never should have introduced this concept of physical presence. So they've overturned both those cases. It's like they never happened. So in theory, you know, the states could go back to all the way back to 1967, which is National Bellis Hess. Um, 
But South Dakota was, was smart. They, they told the U.S. Supreme Court that they were only going to go forward. They were only going to look at this prospectively. They were not going to apply this retroactively. And the Supreme Court was worried about that. So they, they took away one of the fears of the U.S. Supreme Court. And South Dakota said, you know, we think $100,000 or 200 transactions is enough of a link or a connection with our state that it should create nexus and, you know, uh, people selling into the state who cross the, either one of those thresholds should collect and remit our taxes. Um, the Supreme Court didn't explicitly agree with that, but they sort of gave it in an implicit nod. They actually sent it back to the lower court and said, hey, you guys decide on this. And unfortunately, the case was settled without that ever being uh, decided. So we may see some more um, uh, litigation on this uh, around these thresholds. Um, and we have some people contact us and say, hey, we're, we're just waiting um, on uh, this to be readdressed. You know, we don't want to collect a tax. I, I think that's a very foolish position to take because the states, you know, are, are coming and they're coming hard after, after sellers are crossing these thresholds. Uh, everything's on hold right now because of the crisis, but as soon as the crisis is over, I mean, in general, uh, coming out of a recession, historically, the states have gotten a lot more aggressive. Um, you know, they've increased their enforcement, they've increased their discovery, they've increased their collection people. Um, so uh, we don't expect that to be any different this time. We expect it to be even more intense because before the crisis, we already had the states gearing up. I mean, they've, they've been wanting to get, you know, this remote sales, a piece of the, that action for the last, you know, 25 years or more. So um, a lot of, of states, you know, already were being aggressive. And over the next two years, we just expect it to, uh, to be brutal out there. Um, so a lot of states followed South Dakota. The, the point I'm making here is don't wait on this. Uh, don't advise your clients to wait on this. This is the law that we have it as today. And um, if you have exposure and the exposure is material, it's a lot cheaper to just go ahead and do what the states say to do rather than try to fight them later on. Um, but anyway, um, all states but Florida and Missouri have some sort of thresholds right now. And uh, we thought that we'd have something by this time this year on both of those states, but because of the crisis, things have been uh, slowed down. Um, Kansas and Louisiana have thresholds, but uh, Louisiana immediately came out and put theirs on hold because of the local parishes. They had to get something in place to get this all worked out. And, um, it looks like they were going to go live uh, with their thresholds on July 1st. Um, but again, that may be delayed because of the, the crisis. So um, there is a notice and reporting requirement that is live and it has a $50,000 threshold. So if you're over $50,000 in Louisiana right now, uh, we still recommend you get registered. And by July 1st, if Louisiana sticks to their guns, they've got $100,000 or 200 transaction threshold. Kansas came out. And the governor of Kansas actually vetoed uh, the legislation um, twice because they, they tied it to a tax cut. They wanted to cut the tax on groceries. And the governor said, we're in, in tough shape here. We can't afford to give up any taxes whatsoever. So even though this will bring in more revenue, we cannot tie it to a tax cut. Um, so uh, he vetoed uh, the legislation twice. The uh, uh, Department of Revenue said, well, we don't have thresholds because it's been vetoed twice and we can't set thresholds, but the Supreme Court told us we don't need a physical presence. So we're going to use one transaction. And a lot of our competitors they, and a lot of the software companies are still using that one transaction. What they're missing is that the attorney general came out about the Kansas attorney general came out about 10 days later and said, listen, you know, Department of Revenue, you can't do that. You have to at least use the safe harbor provisions of um, South Dakota versus Wayfair 
of 100,000 or 200 transactions. So in Kansas, if you're over those thresholds, then we suggest, uh, and your exposure's material or your client's exposure's material, we suggest registration. A uh, couple things, this is not an internet issue. I mean, we speak to companies, you know, we, we've got a sales force and, you know, they're talking to companies all day long. I've, t I've talked to a number of CPAs. In their minds, they're thinking of this as an internet issue because we get people who say, oh, my clients don't sell over the internet. Or, you know, our salespeople are talking to people who say, oh, we don't sell on the internet. Um, well, do you sell by referral? Uh, yeah. Do you sell by phone? Yes. Um, do you sell by infomercial? You know, some companies do. Do you sell by catalog? This is not an internet issue at all. It's a multi-state tax issue. Anyone who's selling into multiple states can be impacted by economic nexus. And for those who are thinking this is an internet issue, it's, you know, they're setting themselves up for big issues because it applies to everyone who sells into multiple states, no matter how they do it. Something else very important, you know, a couple of times a week, um, I, I get a call from someone who uh, says, I want to deregister. Um, and I ask them why. And they say, well, um, because we are underneath the threshold, you know, a state like California or a state like Texas, $500,000 thresholds, no uh, transaction. And I say, well, the last time we spoke, you had a salesperson located in a state or you had inventory located in a state. Is that not the case anymore? Oh no, we still have that. We're just underneath the threshold. Well, the uh, economic nexus thresholds do not override any other type of nexus. I mean, if you have physical presence nexus, that actually trumps an economic nexus. So this doesn't protect you in any way, shape, or form. It's just one more way for the states to get you to try to collect or pay their taxes. Uh, very, very important. Now, Ellie's going to hand this out. And this is on our website. It's on the free portion of our website. And we keep it updated uh, every time a state comes out and adds new information. Uh, everything that you know, need to know about um, economic nexus is, is on this chart. The data became effective, whether it has uh, a transaction threshold, a lot of states don't, what the monetary threshold is, you know, do they look at uh, the calculation methodology, do they look at just last year, you know, the calendar year, do they look at um, the prior 12 months, you know, previous calendar year or current calendar year, you know, there's basically three ways the states look at this. Um, lots of states include gross sales, even non-taxable sales are included. Um, some states say that exempt sales are included except for sales for resale. Some states include marketplace sales, some states exclude them. So all of that information is on this chart. Um, and I, I encourage you all to, to take a look at it. Um, it can really help out your clients. And I know a lot of the software companies out there are saying, uh, use our software. Well, you know, I'm going to pick on tax jar. You get so many false positives because they're not looking at what sales are excluded. They're just looking at the thresholds um, and they're counting every type of sales. So, um, and, and you know, even though I'm picking on TaxShare, all of the software companies are like this. This is, you're getting false positives all of the time. Um, and some of them uh, are even telling you, even though if you're only selling in a marketplace, uh, you need to still continue collecting tax. And unfortunately, that's just not true. So uh, a lot of our clients are actually deregistering at this point if they're only selling on a marketplace. All right, so... We've got a lot of webinars where we concentrate on Nexus entirely, so we're going to keep this fairly brief. Uh, I do want to talk about third-party Nexus because, um, you know, when the states are, are out there looking for this economic Nexus, they're going to stumble across all types of Nexus, and this is one of the, the big blind spots for companies as well as their advisors because it doesn't make common sense. I mean, how can a third party, someone who has no connection to us whatsoever, how can they create Nexus for us? 
And unfortunately, there are two U.S. Supreme Court cases, one from uh, 1960. Um, it's uh, uh, Scripto, the pen company, uh, and then uh, another one from 1987, and it's called Tyler Pipe. And uh, Tyler Pipe had some important language on it. It says, um, you know, activities of third parties can create nexus if they're helping to establish or maintain a marketplace. So that is really important language because so many of the states took that language and incorporated it directly into their statutes, their rules, their regulations. They rely on it to provide guidance. Um, they uh, rely on it to create policy. Um, the court systems, you know, what better case to use uh, when you're citing precedent than a U.S. Supreme Court case. So uh, the two cases that I talked about were, were both uh, regarding solicitation and sales. You know, in Scripto, we had 10 independent contractors in the state of Florida, and Florida said, hey, these independent contractors, they're giving you enough of a significant presence that you need to collect and pay our taxes. And Scripto said, you're out of your mind. Um, these people don't work for us. We don't control anything they're doing. How in the world can a third party uh, create nexus? And unfortunately, the Supreme Court came back and they said, it's constitutionally insignificant as to what you call these people, how you pay them. Um, what's important is, are they doing the same work that an employee would do? And, you know, this was the beginning of what we call attributional nexus or agency nexus. Um, 27 years later in Tyler Pipe, uh, the state of Washington goes after a Texas company, Tyler Pipe, and uh, they had one independent contractor up in the state of Washington. And Washington said, hey, according to the crypto doctrine, we think you should be collecting our tax. And Tyler Pipe said, no, this is not like crypto at all. I mean, you know, those people were only you know, soliciting business for Scripto. I mean, this person does not represent us exclusively. Um, so it's, it's an entirely different, and they're not very good at their job. They hardly send us any business. And, you know, they're like doing this on a part-time basis. So the court comes back and the court, you know, this U.S. Supreme Court, and they say, you know, it doesn't really, I'm going to paraphrase the beginning here, it doesn't matter what you call someone, doesn't matter how you pay them, doesn't matter if they represent you exclusively or multiple people, um, doesn't matter if they do it on a full-time or part-time uh, basis, what matters is, are they helping to establish or maintain a market? And while both of those cases are solicitation, because that language is really morphed into umbrella language, You've got a whole bunch of different services out there that can uh, fall under this umbrella. Uh, I'm not going to go through each one of these services, and this is not an exhaustive list. What we tell our clients is if you uh, are hiring someone to go into a state to perform services on your behalf, or if you um, uh, have someone who's interacting with the public on your behalf, you know, your customers, then that's generally going to be uh, a nexus creating activity. However, you know, if you hire someone to develop some software for you, um, they're usually not going into a state, they're usually not interacting with your customers. So uh, that generally is not going to be the type of activity that is nexus creating. So there is a distinction, they have to be helping to establish or maintain a marketplace. And by the way, uh, it's not just independent contractors. Um, it's anybody who's helping to establish or maintain a marketplace. I was talking to someone the other day and I said, you know, do you utilize independent contractors? Nope. We don't have any of them. You know, we don't have to worry about any of that. We don't have employees. We don't have independent contractors. I said, well, on your website, it says that, you know, you're, uh, have the ability to do installation around the country. Oh, those are subcontractors. It doesn't matter what you call them. Independent contractors, subcontractors, if you hire a company, you're not thinking of them as a subcontractor or an independent contractor. You're just hiring the services of another company that can create nexus for you. All right, so here are 10 very common nexus creating activities for sales and use tax. Uh, Ellie's gonna hand this out, it's also up on our website. And when we say common, 
the majority of the states look at these the same. They're all going to say that this is, you know, very common nexus creating activities. And then that's in direct contrast to these 12, which these vary widely between the states. Some, some states say it doesn't create nexus at all. And some states say it creates nexus under these uh, activities. So um, the important thing, the takeaway uh, from sales tax uh, nexus is that number one, physical nexus is still alive. Just because everyone's talking about economic nexus, we can't forget that there are activities out there um, that can create nexus for you. Uh, number two, economic nexus, not going away. Do not wait any longer. I mean, uh, yes, South Dakota said that they're only going to enforce this going forward, you know. Um, they're only going to do it prospectively, but that's prospectively from their effective dates. And some of these effective dates are coming up on 18 months at this point. Um, so that's bad enough. But while the states are looking for this economic nexus, they're going to stumble across all types of physical nexus. Uh, independent contractors, major risk factor for a lot of companies out there. It's just a blind spot for a lot of people because it's not common sense. I mean, I don't control the activities of these people. So when we're talking to our clients, we've got to be very cognizant of how third parties can create nexus for us. And then inventory. Um, even though uh, the marketplaces may be collecting tax, and let's, let's use Amazon. Amazon may be collecting the tax, but if you're s selling on multiple platforms, the inventory in those Amazon warehouses still creates nexus. That's a physical presence nexus. And most states are, will take that position. So um, even though uh, the, the tax is being paid by someone else, the nexus is still there. Uh, we've got a number of webinars where we get a little bit deeper into the uh, uh, nexus. We encourage you. Uh, to go to those webinars as, as well. Um, let's talk about how states find you or how they find your customer. Number one, uh, auditing your customers and or vendors. So when an auditor comes out there, they're not just looking at your sales uh, to make sure that um, you're collecting tax on everything you should be. It's at the right rate and that it's all getting remitted uh, to the state. Um, remember we said cardinal sin of, of sales tax is collected, not remitted taxes. So um, the auditor is, is there to do that, but they're also looking at your purchases because just because you purchase something tax, uh, you know, not charge tax on it doesn't mean that it's tax free. Um, you know, unless there's a, an exempt purpose, like a, a, you're purchasing it for resale, um, you're supposed to self-assess and remit it as a consumer use tax, which we're going to talk about later today. Um, but that's a great prospecting area for auditors. Um, some states like Texas, it's a very formal process. And for each unique invoice that uh, there's no tax that's charged on, um, a lead card is filled out. And, um, you know, it's not the end of the world, uh, but you're on a list. And uh, information sharing with other states or the IRS, um, you know, we talked about how independent contractors, subcontractors can create nexus for you. Well, you generally pay them with a 1099. So a lot of states routinely go to the IRS and say, can you please give me a list of people who've gotten a 1099 in my state? And then they compare that list with who's registered or not in their state for other types of taxes. Um, and especially in the Southeast, states talk to each other. So once one state finds you, they're not going to turn your name over to every state out there, but they will turn it over to, you know, the states where they have sharing arrangements. Uh, leads, former employees. I, I don't know if you know this, but um, some states actually pay bounties, um, a, a percentage of the money that they end up collecting. So if you've got a disgruntled employee, they can get their pound of flesh and get paid for doing it. Um, if they know that, you know, you should have been collecting the sales tax. Uh, competitors, um, you know, sometimes you'll get a salesperson out there and, you know, they, sometimes salespeople will say, well, you know, I'm losing sales because I've got to collect sales tax and they're not. So they'll try to level the playing field and call in. Uh, we've had instances where a company gets audited and, you know, they say, 
well, we can't be doing it wrong. The whole industry does it this way. And the state, in one particular instance, Massachusetts said, well, give me a list of... Oops. Sorry about that. Um, in this particular inch, instance, the, uh, uh, the state of Massachusetts said, give me a list of all of these people. And they, uh, they did. And the state followed up with everybody and went after the whole industry. And that's not uncommon. Uh, customers, you know, if you don't charge tax, your customer may call the state and say, hey, you know, do I need to pay a use tax on this? And the state says, uh, who's your vendor? And all of a sudden, you're on a list again. Same thing can happen with your vendors. And some states, like Utah, they just purchased a list of people they believe who have crossed their uh, economic nexus. Uh, a year or so ago, Connecticut purchased a list of people that they thought um, uh, had uh, uh, enough of a connection with Connecticut. So, uh, and then we've got web surfing. So states like Washington routinely go out and look at people's websites. And, you know, it, it, twice in the last week, maybe two weeks, um, my salespeople have come to me and said, look at this. And right on the website, and you know, they've got a landing page. Um, so you don't even have to open up their website. You see it, you know, in the Google listing where it says only pay sales tax in New Jersey. Now they're selling all over the country. They're probably... Uh, have economic nexus everywhere, and they've got this giant flashing neon sign that says, come and audit me. Um, so if nothing, you know, if you have any clients out there who are advertising like this, tell them to take that stuff down. The states are actually looking for uh, information like that. So um, it's, it's a huge, huge red flag. So anyway, these are, are some of the ways that um, states find you. Um, you get put on a list and there are discovery units out there. Their whole job is to follow up on these leads and they also do it in other ways. Um, you know, they've got their own methods, but they're following up on leads that are generated from all these other ways. Um, so Ellie, let's uh, go to the next poll question. Absolutely. That should be up on everyone's screen right now. We want to know what it is about sales tax nexus that concerns you the most. Uh, so we'll leave this open 15, 20 seconds here. Remember, you do have to answer these questions in order to receive CPE credit. Mike, a lot of people are worried about economic nexus. So we do have a mix of other things as well. So we'll close this out in about five seconds and move along. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's move on to taxability. And, you know, taxability can get pretty darn granular. And, you know, when we've got new employees that come on board and we start telling stories about taxability, they're amazed. Um, one of my favorite examples is, is a bagel. You know, I'm originally from New York. Um, so that first bagel there, you know, it's not sliced, so it's not taxable. The second one, just as soon as you slice it, you don't even have to put a schmear on it. You don't do anything else. Just the fact of slicing it makes that bagel taxable. Um, candy. I mean, in the Midwest, you got to look at the percentage of flour. You know, some candy bars have no flour. It's going to be taxable. Some candy bars have a percentage of flour, so it's not taxable. So if I'm buying a Twix, which is candy-coated pretzel, then that's not taxable. But if I'm a buying a Hershey with almonds, then that is taxable. So uh, you can get very, very granular when it comes to uh, taxability. Um, all right, so tangible personal property, which we refer to as TPP, it's something can be seen, touched, felt, smelled, tasted, etc. It's something that can be perceived by the senses, but it's not real property or intangible property. And by default, this is going to be taxable, all right? And tangible personal property, sometimes we're thinking of computers and handbags or whatever. We don't realize it's airplanes and boats and tractors. It's all tangible personal property. Um, and as we said, it's taxable by default unless there's an exemption of which there are many. And exemptions can be by item. You know, in some states, groceries are just exempt. And if it's exempt by item like that, 
and everybody exempt, then you don't have to worry about certificates. Um, it could be exempt by use. You know, maybe you're going to use it in the manufacturing process, or maybe you're purchasing it for resale. Uh, those are types of exemptions for use. Uh, and then my entity, you know, maybe it's a, a, a local entity, maybe you're the federal government, uh, maybe you're a nonprofit. So lots and lots of exemptions out there. But unless it's specifically identified as exempt, it's assumed to be taxable. All right. In TPP, often stretched by statute, for example, electronically delivered software, nothing you can see or touch there, but a lot of states say that they still consider that to be uh, tangible personal property and electricity. I guess you could feel it if you stuck your finger in a socket, but I don't think of electricity as being tangible personal property, but many states do define it in their statutes as tangible personal property. Uh, when we're talking about tangible personal property, you know, what happens when it's incorporated into real property? Now, real property is not generally, uh, you know, subject to sales tax. So if you're making it a part of real property, um, generally not taxable if it's permanently affixed, if it loses its identity or damage to the property occurs if removed. Now, every state has its own definitions. So these are just some of the terms you're going to see, but it's going to be different on a state by state basis. Uh, tangible personal property used or consumed in manufacturing, generally not taxable, but manufacturing process has a start and a finish and each state defines that process differently. Uh, for example, you see a picture of a crane up there. You know, I was uh, involved in an audit. Uh, there were two cranes that were purchased on a tax-free basis. And the state said, well, you got to, you know, pay consumers use tax on both of these. And we proved that one was actually being used in the manufacturing process. Uh, the other one was used maybe 20 feet away um, from the manufacturing line, but it was used to load the trucks. And that was outside of the manufacturing process. And we got one uh, excluded, but the client had to pay the tax on the other one. Uh, so manufacturers sometimes think that they can purchase everything on an exempt basis, but uh, they really can't. Um, for example, intraplant transport in Texas uh, is you know, something that um, is not subject uh, to exemption. So if you buy a forklift and you're trying to use it in Texas, uh, you probably need to pay tax on that. But if you're buying it in, in very many other states, um, it, it can be part of the manufacturing process. So knowing the difference is very, very important. Uh, common phrase when we're talking about um, tangible personal property in the manufacturing process is predominant usage. Services. Okay, unlike tangible personal property, which is going to be taxable by default, Services are generally exempt by default. Most states, you, you know, services must be specifically enumerated. They must be listed in order to be taxable. Now, you know, every time I talk about this, someone's going to give me a hard time. Uh, just about every state taxes, well, let me rephrase that. Every state taxes some type of services. That's what's controversial. People always tell me, well, hey, Mike, in, in uh, Missouri, uh, we don't tax any services. Well, fabrication services, you know, certain types of delivery services. Um, you know, we can go through state by state and, you know, come up with examples of taxable services. And every year, um, you know, states uh, are, are constantly looking to expand their tax base. Uh, more and more services are becoming taxable. Now, sometimes a non-taxable service becomes taxable when sold in conjunction with tangible personal property. For example, California had a great example on their website. I'm not sure if it's still there, but it was, it was there a couple of years ago. Uh, and it was about drapes. And, you know, if you buy drapes, you know, you go into the, into the store and um, you uh, bring in the measurements and you give them and they cut the drapes to, to fit your bedroom. Um, well, that altering service is going to be taxable because it's with the sale of, of tangible personal property. Now you get home, 
and you know you you hang up the drapes that just don't look right and you want to move them to the game room so you go back to uh the, the local tailor and you give them the new measurements and they alter the drapes that's not taxable because it's not with the sale of tangible personal property so you know you can get very granular when when sir when it comes to any type of taxability um, sometimes a non-taxable service becomes taxable when sold in conjunction with taxable services. So if you're selling a gift basket with, you know, some items in it that are not taxable and some items that are, are taxable, in a lot of states, the whole basket becomes taxable. So again, very different from state to state, but don't assume that either your services or your client's services are not taxable because it's changing very, very rapidly. And there are states like uh, South Dakota and Hawaii that even tax accounting services or legal services. Um, and other states have put that forth so far, you know, it hasn't been approved in any other state, but uh, a lot of services out there are taxable. Um, state that tax services by default are Hawaii, New Mexico, South Dakota, and West Virginia. Um, they're the opposite of all the other states. In these states, you know, it has to be specifically enumerated not to be taxable. Uh, here are some commonly taxed services. You know, this is going to be very different from state to state, but these are some of the types of services. And by the way, you, you, you can't just look at the service. For example, here in Texas, you could... Um, look at the listed services and, you know, if you've got a client or if you are doing website design or website hosting, you say, oh, it's not one of the listed services. But when you get down into some of the guidance and some of the cases in Texas, you'll see that Texas actually considers website design and hosting as data processing. Um, I personally don't think of data processing but that's what Texas does. And it's, it's long held and, and a lot of companies in the state of Texas who do website hosting and, uh, or, or website design uh, are finding that they're the subject of an audit because Texas actually targets these types of companies. They know that they get it wrong. All right, so digital property. Uh, it's going to vary widely by state. Some states define digital property. Some states do not. Uh, software is generally going to be taxed differently than digital property. Uh, software uh, has been around a lot longer, and a lot of the states, you know, have their own rules for software. It may be, uh, you know, defined as tangible personal property. Uh, uh, it, it, you know, services are changing quickly. Digital property perhaps is changing even more rapidly. Uh, so earlier this year, South Dakota and DC began collecting tax on digital products. All right, Ellie, let's do the final poll question. Yeah, absolutely. That should be up on everyone's screen right now. Uh, just a quick uh, quiz for you here. Which of the following statements is true? We will leave this up for 15, 20 seconds. Remember, you do have to answer these poll questions in order to, in order to receive CPE credits, especially since this is our last poll question for the day. Um, Mike, answers are still rolling in, so I'm gonna leave this open a few more seconds here. A lot of people are answering that all states tax at least some services. Do you wanna go over this really quickly? That is the following true statement. Fantastic, smart group. Uh, we were going to close this out and move on. Great. Uh, by the way, when it comes to taxability, um, automation isn't going to help you determine upfront which is of uh, your services or products are taxable. You usually have to do some sort of research into that or hire like someone like us to do that research. But once uh, you do get that set up, it's great for automation because uh, you can now match your codes with the software's codes, uh, provided they have a code that fits what you're doing and they'll keep it updated automatically. So uh, lends itself very, very well to automation. Uh, our two favorite companies out there um, are uh, gonna be Vertex and Avalara. Yes, they're more expensive. However, you are more likely to get audited for sales tax than any other type of tax out there, including income tax, 
Um, and there's a lot more states involved and, you know, the states are a lot more aggressive than the IRS is. Um, so you want to make sure that you're getting this done right and it pays to get things done uh, correctly the first time. I mean, if, you, if you're out there looking for the cheapest solution, you, you get what you pay for a lot of times. Um, all right, so with rates, this is uh, every color up there, and I'm colorblind. Um, he represents a different taxing jurisdiction. Um, I've heard all sorts of numbers. We use 13,000. Uh, if anyone wants to count all of those boxes and come back to us with a, an accurate number, um, we'll go ahead and give you a, a free subscription to our premium portion of our website. But um, no matter what you look at, whether it's 7,500 or 13,000, there are a lot of jurisdictions out there. Um, so this, it, again, is an area, it lends itself very well um, to automation. So uh, origin versus destination. Um, whenever you're crossing a state line, you're gonna use destination-based rates. Uh, origin, uh, some of the software companies out there um, make much too big of an issue of this uh, to the point where we have people calling up and say, well, I'm in an origin state, so I don't have to collect tax in any of the other states. No, that's not what that means. It just means that if it's never leaving the state and the state is an origin state, that controls which local rates you collect. It has nothing to do with, with which state's rate you go ahead and collect. That's always going to be based on the destination, or not always, but almost always, when we're talking about interstate sales of tangible personal property, uh, we're going to use the uh, delivery state's rate. Uh, for interstate sales, we may look at uh, origin-based. All right, so what about digital services or digital property? Generally, where the benefit is received is uh, how we're gonna look at services. Uh, for digital property, there's a hierarchy of knowledge known at the time of sales in a lot of states. So here's an example of a hierarchy of knowledge. Um, and it's, what do you know at the point of sales? So you can go through this list. A lot of times it's, you know, you're not going to know anything about that customer except for the billing information on the credit card. So that is one of the, the fallbacks here. Uh, sometimes, um, rather than go through all of this, companies just say, okay, this is what we're going to use um, because it's, it's what we're going to know pretty much in every sale. All right, so how do you figure out the rates? Well, it, you know, you can call the state, check the state website. You know, if you're only doing, you know, a couple sales a day, that's, that's easy. Uh, there are free rate lookup, uh, you know, programs out there. Uh, again, you're doing two or three sales a day, that's good. Um, there are rate tables, you know, if you have a legacy system, you know, something you built yourself, um, maybe you need a rate table, we can help you provide that, or, you know, maybe you just go ahead and automate the, uh, the whole solution. All right, so let's talk about use tax. And use tax, historically speaking, it was widely believed that interstate commerce could not be taxed directly. So they came up with this idea of a complementary tax for the storage use or consumption in the state. And set that, sellers still had to collect the tax if they had an excess, but it wasn't a tax directly on interstate commerce. And what this prevented was a company that set up on the other side of a border. Maybe they were 100 feet away from their competitor and the in-state um, company had to collect the sales tax. The out-of-state company did. So that's how use tax came about. And uh, technically speaking, only sales that never cross a state line are subject to sales tax. States that do cross a state line are technically subject to use tax. However, since 1977, when we have complete auto transit and the U.S. Supreme Court said that, yes, states can tax interstate commerce directly, the lines have been blurred. In some states, it doesn't make a difference um, you know, what you're calling it. In other states, it still does. It makes a difference in registrations. It makes a difference in ta tax rates. makes a difference in which forms you need to file on. 
Um, but in a lot of states, uh, they only know a consumer use tax. And, you know, if our vendors don't charge us tax, doesn't mean that the purchase is tax free. If a seller does not charge you tax on a, on a taxable sale, you're required to self assess accrue and then remit it to the state. And this goes for individuals as well as businesses, but individuals are not audited. So very few individuals uh, actually pay attention to this. That's starting to change. Some states are putting this on the state income tax form, but by and large, um, you know, the individuals don't uh, worry about consumer use tax. But this is either the number one or number two problem for most companies in an audit. Um, the, you know, if it's not consumer use tax, then it's certificates, which we'll talk about on Friday. So big, big issue here. Now with consumer use tax, you got to have a system in place and, you know, you can review all of your invoices, but if you have thousands of purchase invoices, uh, maybe you just uh, look at invoices over a certain amount um, and you look at every one of those and then, um, you know, you look at just a sample of in, uh of invoices when you're looking at the smaller invoices. And if you know certain vendors have issues, if they get the rate wrong all of the time, um, maybe you target them. And it doesn't matter if you use a manual or automated, this, you know, you really need a blended approach here. A lot of these software companies will tell you they have a great solution. This is not something that lends itself well to automation. Uh, there is no perfect solution out there. Uh, perfection is not a realistic goal, but you just want to catch most of the underpayments. Um, and then it's not always about paying tax. Sometimes it's about not paying tax. So uh, a lot of times if you have someone checking the certificates, you'll see that people, because they don't know if they should be collecting tax or not. So they may be charging you tax when they don't have to, or they may be charging the highest rate when it should be a lower rate. So uh, when you have a use tax accrual system in place, it's not just about catching tax that you need to pay to the state. It's also about finding refunds. Uh, I'll do a real quick story here. We, it's a little bit humorous. Um, and we were involved in an audit one time. And this woman thought she was doing, you know, the company a great deal. She was issuing, you know, resale or exemption certificates for everything. They were a manufacturing company. And she thought she was saving the company all of this money. And the auditor comes in and says, hey, why, why are you issuing, you know, manufacturing certificates for toilet paper? Yes, it is, it is used and consumed but it's not used and consumed in your manufacturing process. And, you know, we all got a chuckle out of that. Unfortunately, the woman at the, uh, at the company that was responsible for this was mortified. Um, they were purchasing for the entire, you know, country. And she had to go to her bosses and say, you know, hey, we owe a couple hundred thousand dollars in, in taxes. And a large portion of that is due to uh, taxes we had waived on toilet paper. All right, Ellie, so I had to bring in my toilet paper story since uh, this is the- Relevant, right? <laughs> re relevant in this crisis we're going through. Um, but let's open it up to questions at this point. Yeah, let's do a couple of quick questions here, Mike. So uh, this question is, I believe about taxability. Um, taxability, so how about the fuel for those tax exempt equipment? Oh, just about the fuel. Um, it's gonna be different um, state by state. So um, what the equipment is being used for and, you know, if uh, sometimes it's, it's going to be taxable and sometimes it's not. So uh, taxability is something that you generally don't want off the top of the head answers to uh, because it is so very, very different um, uh, on a state by state basis and on a very granular basis. I mean, and this is not related to the question, but, you know, the size of the container, the color of the container, the material of the container, a lot of these things can affect taxability. So uh, I'm pretty good with Nexus. I can pretty much give you all of the rules off the top of my head. But when it comes to taxability, I don't know of anybody out there. There's just so many different products. Um, you just, and they're so different in each state. You just can't keep it all on the top of your head. All right, thank you. And um, one more quick question here, Mike. Uh, how do you feel? How do you feel the states will survive with businesses closed due to COVID nineteen? 
Um, while there are some states out there who are hurting worse than others, it's because they continually mismanage their finances. Uh, we may see a couple of the states actually file bankruptcy. But one thing we see coming out of all recessions, and this is going to be a doozy, because um, the states need, have such a need for more revenue because so many of their you know, citizens, their, their taxpayers, they, they need additional services. I mean, there are a lot of people out there, you know, unemployment and all sorts of other assistance programs, and the state's got to provide that money but they're not getting it from income tax. They're not getting it from sales tax. I mean, even if people are paying on time, their sales are just down. So historically, what these states have done is hire more auditors. They, they, they put them into discovery. They're going out and looking for new companies, you know, preferably out-of-state companies because their in-state companies are already hurting. So they don't want to pile on um, so they're going towards uh, out-of-state companies. Um, you know, the reason why certificates are such a big issue is because uh, back coming out of the 2008, uh, 2009 recession there, uh, states said, you know, we don't want to, you know, raise taxes, but what laws can we impose um, that we haven't been imposing before? And that's how certificates became a, a matter of uh, uh, form over substance rather than the other way around. So you got to dot all of your I's and all of your T's. Coming out of this recession, I expect the states to be extremely, extremely aggressive um, because they're in such a hole, number one. Um, I think that we may see states start to expand their tax base and you know try to get some of these out-of-state service providers. Um, I think that um, these states like Texas, which is currently, they've got like, I don't know, 20 ads for auditors right now. So where most states are doing shutdowns or laying people off, Texas is actually hiring auditors. So they're true to history. They're getting ready to come after people strong. They've got to find, you know, how to get the coffers filled back up with this revenue. Um, and we know a lot of states were already coming strong because of the uh, of the economic nexus. This is brand new, and there's a lot of companies out there that just aren't paying attention to this, so the states see that as fertile ground. And once again, it's not their in-state, you know, companies. Uh, they're protecting their in-state businesses from the out-of-state, so uh, the people who can vote them out of office, they're trying to protect, uh, so that's all going to be very, very acceptable. Um, so I, I just think that, you know, the states, they're not going to start coming hard after anyone. So as long as we're still talking about the virus, they're, they're just not going to pile on like that. But as these states start opening back up and we start talking about the recovery, I expect the states to be coming hard after everybody, which is why, even though it's tough right now, um, you got to check what your nexus footprint is. Where may you have exposure? Where may your clients have exposure? and start taking the steps now because as bad as things are, they can always be a lot worse if one of these states finds you and they're not going to be warm and fuzzy. Uh, they're gonna be making examples of people and you know you can you know, tell them, hey, feel bad for me, the economy, everything else. The states need revenue. They can't afford to be warm and, and cozy and friendly. And generally, you're gonna be from outside their state anyway. So they're specifically targeting you. That's my two cents. All right, thank you so much, Mike. Uh, thank you everyone for attending today. We hope we see you for part two of this webinar on Friday. Uh, we will be talking about the remaining uh, sales tax strategies. If you didn't register yet, um, head to our website. That link will also be in the email that you will receive in 24 hours. And Mike, did you want to say anything else before we? Yeah, I, I just want to make sure that everyone understands we could do a full day presentation on each one of these topics. Um, what our goal is in part one and part two is to make you aware of these different pillars. And then uh, we have other webinars we'll be doing about each one of these pillars. So, 
uh, like we, I, I mentioned a lot of the nexus, but we'll be doing one on uh, use tax. We'll be doing another one on exemption certificates. We'll be doing another one on taxability. This big introduction here is just to make you aware of the potential issues out there. And thank you everyone for coming. Um, please give us brutally honest feedback. And uh, if you have good ideas for other webinars, please let us know about them. Thank, Thank you, you so much, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.